Well done. Welcome to the Mill Valley Film Festival. I'm Zoe Elton, Director of Programming for the festival, and uh, what an honor it is to celebrate your great work in herself. Thank you so much for that. I love the film, and I love that you take a situation and subject matter that a lesser writer and a lesser perhaps human being might have treated with a different kind of attitude, when, with an eye that might exploit the aggressions in the story. Instead, you reveal the heart and the courage and the humanness and the humor in this all. And in doing that, you prove yourself twice over, both as an actor and as a writer. So thank you for this great alignment of your talents and for the gifts that you bring to film and to storytelling. Your work's a revelation, it's great. And it's my honor to present you virtually, of course, with the Mill Valley Film Festival Award. Um, so this will be coming to you, uh, we'll ship it to you. And thank you so much, Claire. Um, I really also look forward to seeing where your work takes you next. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to receive my first ever acting award. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> first ever. Um, so yeah, I really, um, I really feel honored, especially at your festival where you obviously showcase such amazing stories from all over the world and the US. So just thank you, it's such an honor. And um, I suppose on a quick thank you list then, I just want to thank obviously Sharon and Philida, Rory, Ed, Clelia and Andrew and Rose and everyone at BFI and Screen Ireland who helped make the film. And um, obviously all the cast and crew, especially my children, <laughs> my fake children. And then just every person who let me fantasize in their presence about this thing that I was going to try and make. And um, I'd also love to just thank my sisters who are the best women and mothers in the world and who really inspired Sandra's spirit. I'd like to thank my partner, Jack, who saw me through the tough days and the great days. And also, um, last but not least, my parents who believe in me even when I don't. So um, also I mustn't forget every person that I met along the way researching this film. Thank you to them for showing me an insight into the world and into what they do in these real situations. It really gave me great hope for humanity. So thank you all, thank you so much. And I'm really, really grateful. Thank you, Claire. Well, we're back with Claire Dunn again. And uh, I know this has been an amazing experience for those of you in the audience, virtually in the audience. So welcome back, Claire. Uh, thank you again for this incredible film. I, I am just so delighted that we've been able to, to, to show this film to our audience here in California and around the United States. Um, but it's really amazing that uh, this is not only your uh, first screenplay, which we'll talk about, but this is also you, your first lead in, in a motion picture. So it, it's just incredible. And, uh, and I, I think your, your screenplay, uh, well, we'll get to the screenplay in a minute, but you know, since I, you, you, this is your first film, could you, you know, give, give us a little background about, you know, did you go to, um, did you study film? I know you have a whole body of work in theater and I wanna talk a little bit about that, but could you tell us about your passion for acting and uh, where that came from and where it led you? Yeah, um, well, it simply started out as my mom asked me what I wanted to do when I was a kid. And I said, I love telling stories and making my friends laugh. So initially it was quite innocent, but then eventually it did turn into getting into drama school and doing acting as you know, and then working in the theater. But I suppose um, I've always just had a love affair with film. Um, I've gone to see, I've gone to the cinema even on my own since I was like 15. And that was really unusual. People thought I was a weirdo because I actually went to the cinema on By my yourself? own. And they thought it was so brave, but I was like, I thought of it as, as a kind of sanctuary. I thought like that's just where I go to get filled with like awe about life again and just feel really alive. I just found it so... I don't know, it was just 
it just had me, you know. Um, so when, when it came to the point in my life where I decided to start writing a movie, I hadn't really gotten into any movies. <laughs> so I just was like, I wonder if I'm going to have to find a different way in. And uh, I was in New York just like doing auditions and pilot season. And oh God, it was a bit... Uh, well, it was tough, you know, it wasn't as tough as it would be in LA, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure you'd get a lot more going on. But basically, um, you know, I was there and then a friend of mine rang me um, who said like, oh, like she basically a single mother with three children and she had to declare herself homeless when she, in Dublin in order to get some temporary accommodation. And I suppose I was standing there at this point in my own career going, what am I really doing? And I don't know if I'm that happy every day of my life. Like, I think I'm happy when I get the acting jobs. Yeah, but there's something missing. And then my own friend was going through this situation. And in that culmination of kind of desire for something better and just wishing for something better, I started to just fantasize about my friend being able to build her own house with her own two hands, finding a plot of land, making it very simple again. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got the flash for the idea of the film. It was literally like all in that day. It was just like, oh yeah, a woman is getting out of a horrible situation. It'll have to be like really horrible and almost life-threatening or feel life-threatening. And she has to make her own refuge. Like, and because she decides to help herself, um, uh, the right kind of help comes to her. That was kind of like the wishy-washy sort of uh, subconscious flush that came at me. And, um, and I think from there it was like, well, I have the idea I don't know, have the know-how of how to write, but I guess I'll just give it a go. <laughs> and I started to self, you know, self-teach or whatever it is. And, um, you know, Sandra built a house and I built a film. It was kind of th the same things going on at the same time. But I think, uh, yeah, my first love has always been acting and actually genuinely it has been making people laugh and singing, but I didn't expect myself to turn around and then write <laughs> that was a bit less it yeah, wasn't exactly like lighthearted, but there is there is weight in there <laughs> yeah yes it's, you know it's, it definitely yeah. is uh, real life and real life has its uh fun moments as well as its serious moments and but what was amazing is you came up with this conceit of what if and it's about the house mm -hmm. and you know, and, and your friends in, in in the position she's in very very serious troubling position, but you, you threw, you had so many um, social concerns that were built into it so naturally w without preaching. And in a sense, I was thinking the other day, this is like uh, Rocky, you know, this is your Rocky. You are Sylvester Stallone, you know, you create, you know, there's the story of him coming out of nowhere and creating this script. It, it's, to me, uh, completely different movies, but uh, it, it really is. You are Rocky and Sylvester Stallone. Uh, <laughs> wow, I never thought I'd get that comparison. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, the Mill Valley. Yeah, is, like, is look, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I've actually been to Philadelphia and I ran up those steps and I was like, <laughs> yeah, I could do that. Yeah, you know, it's I did all that when I was <laughs> But I do want to talk about Sorry. your acting career because, um, and then come back to the, to the screenplay in a minute, because you have worked with Phil and Lloyd in theater, and you have mm -hmm. worked with Harriet, and who you work with in the movie in theater, and uh, they're part of you know I look at it as part of your support group or your or your your team, and. Um, I, I, and could you tell us a little bit about the work that you've done with the two of them? Because it's really been quite incredible, the theatre aspects. Yeah, and um, I mean, well, the, the theatre I did with Phil and Harriet was the all-female Shakespeare um, uh, productions that we did in London and then in St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn. And I think that was basically the most transformative experience of my career because I think... I think we basically pushed the bar, like we 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 pushed out some barriers there um, by doing that. It's not that there hasn't been all female or females playing male roles um, before, that's been done before. What we were doing was also a social mission. I think Phyllis Deloitte is basically a kind of, 
hero and believes that stories have the power to transform. And, and when we workshop with stories of people, and mm-hmm. um, they have a really, really important place and, and power in, in helping people uh, get through certain things. And so this whole thing was set in like ladies prison. It was like a, f- a female prison. And then we were prisoners putting on the play. So it was sort of about what, what, what you can do to transform people with, with storytelling and drama as well. Um, and also gave a great like layer and bedrock to the world of Shakespeare, which is so dramatic sometimes and has several deaths or huge amounts of betrayal. And then next minute loads of comedy and somebody getting drunk. And it's just like so full. And um, I think that experience just really expanded me as an actor. Playing Prince Hal, for instance, who... I gave the prisoner story a kind of story of addiction and uh, stuff that he was trying to get through because Prince Hal himself is so addicted mm. to small beers and partying and wanting to be around all the locals, you know. So we did this thing where we mirrored um, our prisoners with uh, our our characters and that whole experience just really upped my game as an actor and actually probably gave me standards you know that I wanted to keep so I was actually a bit fussy about the roles that I was playing after it you know and um, and before that like just because you're asking about my acting career in general it, it has been actually a lot of a mix of and um, classical and contemporary stuff but I think in the recent years just in the last few years I really discovered and um, the power of like spoken word and speaking in rhyme and then singing again because I used to write songs and so I think I've realized that basically acting is so interesting and a lot of actors now are realizing that they can actually be the person that creates a story as well and because at the end of the day we're all storytellers (laughs) that's what I've realized it's such a simple thing but uh, to really realize and and apply yourself to it in a way is, is, is quite freeing but yeah so I've mostly done theater and then the 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 formative years of just working with Phyllis and Harriet definitely helped me find my voice, if you know what I mean, and uh, realize the stories I want to tell. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And actually, when you say some are uh, classical and some are modern stories, in the case of the Shakespeare All Women series, it was both, right? Because they were, as you said, reenacted yeah. in temporary time. But it was interesting because I read something that Phyllis said about when she, you first auditioned for Portia, she goes saying as a compliment, I'll never forget her audition. And I think your retort was, I think it was the worst audition in the world. I came out of the audition like, I don't know what just happened <laughs> because Phyllis Lloyd is a genius. She is an amazing woman because she gets people out of their comfort zone immediately and gets them to apply themselves to a huge task in the room, you know, when they're auditioning. So you kind of come out going, I hope I did the thing she asked me to do, but you, you essentially forget if you're any good or not. You don't, you don't really realise what's happened. But... Um, yeah, no, she, she she enjoyed the audition, which is great, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but really, it's it's her I'd have to thank anyway for getting me this far. She's the one that's after helping me get this film on the road and the one who put me in the centre of it when originally I hadn't planned to. I just wanted to get it made. Um, and she not only, like, wanted to direct it and cast me in it, she let the film imbue into her very being. And it was like she kind of knew what the answers were for the film or what we needed for problem solving or certain moments and scenes. Like she was a dramaturgical genius as well Mm. because she started to really understand the fabric of it and, and understand where it came from and what I had done to get it to where it was. And she just became the most kind of protective uh, and like, I don't know, maybe overly protective and passionate person about the story that we were telling. So I don't know, I'll I'll never be able to thank her enough. I don't think I thanked her enough in my speech, so I guess I'm trying to plug it now. And honestly, without her, the film would not be what it is at all, of course. Um, But I just always knew it was in safe hands. and, And I just, 
I'll be forever grateful that she wants to put me in it. That's, that's the main thing. Um, well, you put together, you, you have a, foul, a fabulous team that was pushing to get this film made. It, it was a force. So I understand uh, Sharon Horgan, uh, uh, am I getting her name correct, from Catastrophe, uh, her production yeah. company, she specifically was involved and she was one of the first people you sent the script to? Yeah, yeah, she was the first person that wanted to kind of uh, make it happen, basically, if you know what I mean. Then it was Philida who got on board with it and then Element Pictures, of course, who you know. Um, so, yeah, Sharon is an amazing person because she actually not only uh, responded to my email, but like she clicked on my script and she read it, you know, <laughs> like she... Yeah. She could have left it there for months, but she she actually just got too curious. She's just too curious about new writers. And she took a look and asked to chat to me on the phone the next day. And she just, she's an amazing person because she backs new talent all over. Like she's she's behind a lot of new writers and actors coming through. And um, so she's a very generous person as well. Uh, and she just really cares about stories and cares about the detail. And so I was very lucky to have her on board from the start. And um, yeah, so it's kind of because of her that the ball started rolling. Yeah, so uh, she was on from the start. And then uh, mm -hmm. you asked Filda to direct. And we know what happened there. Well, I didn't ask her to direct. I asked her to take a look at the script. Oh. <laughs> she heard about it, asked to look at it. And then I, I kind of didn't... I didn't quite ask her. I just was like, hmm, that'd be cool if she liked it enough to direct it. But it was because I suppose, like, it's something typical of me that I was almost like, well, she's obviously not going to direct that because she has so much on and she's still a Deloitte. And, um, but she, and she did have a lot on. And she said to me, oh God, I've got loads on. I wish I could like consider this. But then she just said she, she sat with it for a few days and looked at the script again. And she just decided it was, the one she would do next, like it was the film that she was going to try and do next. Um, and I, I, like I've only heard her speaking in interviews with me along the press tour here. Um, but it seems like sometimes, I think I'd say as a director as well, because you have to sort of throw yourself into the film and almost give up all your hours to it. I think you're, you're just looking for something that's going to pull you in and keep you interested enough to, to keep going. Um, and I think thankfully it did. It probably it's probably because I and Philida and Harriet and a lot of us we've we've probably got a similar desire about the kind of stories we want to tell and I think it chimed with that for her. So well, yeah, was, God, I'm so grateful for that. For all of us who got to see the film. Um, and and then yeah. the three of you went to see this production company, Element. And I kind of visualized yeah. this, this force coming there and you kick down the door and <laughs> but I sure it wasn't. <laughs> they, they were really receptive, and they and they uh, they do great work. And um, I think probably now is a, is a great time to bring a uh, Tilda back into the conversation. Why don't we do that and ask her to join us? Well, hello, Tilda. Uh, Tilda Lloyd, of course, is the director of herself and in other films, as well as many theater pieces, opera. And it's such a pleasure to have you join this panel and be here with us at the 43rd Mill Valley Film Festival. Uh, Claire and I were just discussing uh, the moment when you decided that uh, you would direct herself. And there was one condition, I understand, at that time uh, that you said in order to direct. Could you, do you recall that? And could you talk about that a little bit? I do. I mean, I, I didn't know what kind of, as we say in the UK, what clout I had um, to, to sort of lay down conditions, but I decided to um, risk it and say that I, I wasn't going to do it unless Claire played the lead because she was um, quite selflessly so on, on a mission to get this film made. She wasn't insisting that she played Sandra um, she had a, a sister character at one point in the story and she thought maybe she would, she'd step into that role. And I just thought, I heard someone say one day, 
who'd read the screenplay, my God, Claire's written a role for a great movie actress. And I just thought, yeah, herself. And saw this, you know, side, you know, supporting role. Um, she's got to do this. And, and, you know, as passionate as I was about the screenplay, um, I also was so eager um, that the world should see her on screen. Well, that was a, uh, I thank you for that decision. And I think you did have the clout and more importantly, the intu intuition and sense to know that Claire would just be fabulous in, in this film. Um, I, I think at this point, you had assembled like a, uh, a team that is a force of nature in a sense uh, with Sharon and, and uh, Claire and yourself, and I understand at that point that you went to a company called Element, and uh, I am familiar with that company and certainly the work they did with The Favorite and uh, The Lobster, and also a little film called Room. And actually, this is um, not that Brie Larson's performance in any way uh, reminded me of your performance, they're totally different films um, and performances, but I had said to myself, and I think I said it to a number of people uh, once we were able to confirm herself, that this reminded me of when we premiered Room with Brie Larson, and that it was just such a moment in time, and, and, I, and I feel so uh, close with this film, I, I feel that as well. So when I saw that it was actually the same production company, I went, oh, that's really curious. But uh, tell us about uh, your conversations with them and, and particularly, you know, um, how you felt the film should be produced, the budget and the elements that were important that you needed to speak to when you got to that point. I mean, we were lucky to have fantastic producers, Sharon, Rory Gilmartin and Ed Guiney. It was a real kind of family um, ensemble team teamwork i mean one of the things that some directors might find strange was i i didn't want to claire to have to be surrounded by so-called stars in the other roles and there was a point at which i because i felt the focus had to be entirely on her and so i went to them and said you know could we bring the budget down and they looked at me with a kind of like, what? I don't think we've heard this before, this approach. <laughs> um, and so we brought the budget down in order to just bring together the, the best um, ensemble of Irish actors. And obviously Harriet came in um, from the UK, but it was it, the, the ensemble, the mehol, um, as it were, the, this Irish word for, you know, neighbors helping each other, that was absolutely at the center of what we wanted and, and how we wanted to work um, to, create, to create that um, that atmosphere on the set. And that sense that actually some of this is actually happening because that's what Claire gave us, the sense that this was not a performance, it wasn't acting, it was actually happening in front of us. Well, the cast is spectacular, uh, and uh, I would uh, not necessarily start with this first, but your children, your children in the film, Claire, uh, they were just amazing and so important to everything in terms of the relation, not just with the relationship with you, but their father, who was played by um, Ian, Ian Lloyd Anderson, uh, who was mm -hmm. fantastic, and I'm sure he's nothing like that in real life. <laughs> and, uh, but could you talk that a little bit about awesome. that? Because, you know, even from the moment the film starts, um, Molly is, I believe it was Molly, was, you know, the savior of, of your life, in a sense. And, oh, yeah, the eldest sister, sorry, is Emma. And she is, oh, yeah, yeah she's given sorry, the job. Kind of, no, you're fine. It's the code word. And she goes with what's called a safety box, which is something that a lot of women are advised by certain, um, like, so when you go to, you know, women's aid or refuge or one of those bodies that 
actually like you can call it a helpline um, if you're in a certain situation and they sometimes advise you to make this thing called a safety box and then yes uh, Emma was given the job of like running with the safety box sorry the light in my room is so bad um, but basically uh, yeah, the, there was an important aspect to the casting of the children, which was, A, we need to obviously think that they were going to be able for quite um, a lot of hours actually shooting. You know, it was going to be a five-week shoot, but it was going to be pretty intense. And also that they'd be able for the themes and the story and what's happening in the story. But thankfully, their parents were amazing at explaining everything to them. Um, but also on set, they just gave us so much. They were very generous with their energy they were filled with imagination if you asked them to do anything like just play for a bit like they had no problem you know they kind of had endless amounts to give without being um inauthentic it wasn't very it wasn't like um fake or put on it was just very natural and very organic and um, but i do think uh i think philida has a good story about molly that i can't tell as well but they definitely gave us insights into what they were seeing in the story so i left philida to take over that bit <laughs> Yeah, it was just a, a kind of real lesson in don't patronise the children because um, we were, uh, it was a moment where Ian was just strapping Molly into the, her seatbelt in the back of the car and she was struggling to um, stop chatting to him every time he said, are you all right there, Molly? She was like, yeah, I'm fine. And um, I had to, I kept saying to her, um, Molly, you, you don't need to say a word to him, just, just sit still. And... Um, she was just, you know, a bit tired, losing concentration or whatever. And she kept sort of chipping in. And I said, look, you're not going to speak to your dad again. You're not going to say a single word to him until he says sorry to your mom for what she's done. And she looked at me with this cold stare and just said, is sorry enough? Wow. And I thought, okay, <laughs> okay, I don't need to kind of dress it up, just, just talk to her. She was just so, um, well, she's going to be, we think, Lady Gaga when she grows up. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole cast is phenomenal. And when, when I talk about uh, the team, I, I also understand that Harriet um, is somebody that you've also, Claire, you've known, and Phil, you've worked with her, and the three of you have worked together. So I guess when I speak to the team, I would add her to the team as well. Uh, such an amazing actress, and, and uh, uh, what was it like? You Well, you had worked with her for, before, Claire, as well as Phil, uh, directed her, is that true? Yeah, Phil brought, brought us together in our first ever encounter, which was um, the female Shakespeare um, shows that we did with John Marr and did in St. Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn. And so, yeah, I played her wife, her arch enemy. I played her son. I uh, I also even stayed over in her house when uh, we were doing a run in London and I was based in Ireland at the time. So I was her lodger. Um, and then just now we just, we ended up in a Ridley Scott movie together. So it seems like a bit of a theme in my life that I just work with Harriet Walter. But um, Philida and I and Harriet definitely have a bit of a shorthand with each other. And there's a lovely comfort and a kind of, I suppose we all feel very bonded in our mission together to tell stories of our generation and, and like good kind of, um, not just positive for the sake of being sort of Pollyanna and looking at the world like, oh, we need a utopia, but genuinely with a bit of a social mission for equality all around. And because we're so bonded in what we believe in um, for humanity, we also just have this huge bond as storytellers. And I find that like when we were on set, it would just only take a little nod or a look or like, a couple of words and I'd be like, oh, that's what we need to do. Yeah. And it would be a nice shorthand, quick way into things. And it was very comfortable. I think it provided a great bedrock for us to, to work from then once we were on the set, when time is of the essence. Well, you could really feel that. And uh, um, actually, when I was kind of reading something about, you know, the backstory of the house and Harriet and her life as a doctor, even all those things that are unsaid, I'm reading and going, yes, yes, absolutely. That's what I thought. And uh, had you filled it, have you worked with Harriet as, uh, on film as well or primarily theatre? Um, 
No, we'd, we'd recorded um, her sort of mind-boggling performances. She did, she performed three of the sort of great Shakespearean roles in, in one day, uh, male roles in one day. Um, and I'd recorded them on screen and I knew, you know, her screen work really well. She's just, she's as comfortable on screen as she is on stage. Um, very relaxed, like Claire, very relaxed, which... Um, made a huge impact so uh, yeah we, it was a very good uh bond, a team thing with the three of us when she uh, accompanied you claire to the hearing uh that was some very powerful moments uh of course with you yourself and ultimately how you reacted it was like um i i just can't say enough about it but also with harriet and her interactions with you and, and supporting you in that way. Uh, um, it, it's amazing how in all these performances and you talk about the elements that are important to this story in terms of uh, uh, abuse and um, community and lack of housing um, and all those really important things that are at the heart and soul of it, that how with so subtly that these are portrayed and not just portrayed, but so effective and powerful. It's, it's like walking a tightrope. And uh, uh, could you kind of speak to the, um, how you took a, um, a serious subject like this uh, from any perspective, from its, whether it's the cast and their acting or your, uh, your screenplay and the, or the directing, who are able to walk that tightrope of um, deal with this and have it talk to hope in such a great way um, it, it really was quite astounding. How that, how that yeah, worked. because I mean, we, we we go to the cinema not not to be kind of morally bashed over the head or just told a bunch of information. I mean, you right. choose to go to a documentary or you choose to go see a movie, and I suppose through the facts and the research and through the endless interviews I did with people. I realised there was something behind the statue, as they say. They always say, there's this famous quote that somebody told me at one point, just like, look behind the statue. And every time I was on a trip to see like an economist or a, an eco village or chat to, I don't know, a family psychologist or whatever, uh, or even when I was in the really tough spots like the family courts or the place where you go to get a barring order if you need a sudden barring order for somebody who's literally attacking you. And... Um, I realized and learned and observed um, so much magic, like so many little moments of human kindness that are sometimes missed, I think, by most of us. And um, just little connections and little details that made me realize that needs to be knitted into the film. But not just that, but that we express what's really going on behind the closed doors of courts and what people are actually going through and feeling, and maybe just pushing the boat on what, what, what it could be like as well. And so I think it was a really hard thing to tread. Like, as you say, like, how do you, you know, how do you just balance it out? It's difficult, but I think you get a chance to rewrite an editing, right? <laughs> and you also get a chance to, on the day, just express something right from your gut or your heart. So. I had no problem with anyone who's in the moment and just added a phrase or added a sentence or said something. And Harriet was like, I don't know, she was like just so brilliant in that scene in the bathroom when she's willing Sandra to go back in mm. because she had this like speech that was like really, really like it was written and it was there and she had it ages. But then in the moment, I think she added a couple of phrases that, just came from her because she was so urgently wanting Sandra to get something. And those little magic moments really added something, I think. Um, and, and I think that's what a screenplay should be as well. It's not just that you stick to every single comma and dash. It's that it becomes the spine and then the actor gets to flash it out. Yeah, I, I, I can agree with you more, but it, it does come back as well to the screenplay. Mm -hmm. And I know, Phil, that you... When you read the screenplay, I, I, obviously you had a positive response to it, but I, I recall kind of some things that you you were surprised about. This was, if I'm correct, Claire, your first screenplay. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I was really struck by two things. One was just how, for a first time writer, Claire had an incredible sense of the proportion of film, that the relationship between speech and image and silence, and also how she, and, and this was another crucial aspect of the tone of the film that, that the, the ensemble of actors were able to kind of access, was the, the, the kind of, she took this very traumatic subject and yet treated it with, um, w with hope, but also in places with great humour. And the wit with which um, Sandra and the other characters um, sort of flew off the page w was really significant. And I think that's partly, um, you know, it's Claire's natural gift. It, it's very much the tone, um, you know, an Irish um, sort of trope that when things are, you know, you're up shit creek without a paddle, someone comes in with a great one liner and just, um, and, and for us as well, the work we were doing, this sort of world of Shakespeare where literally you can have somebody slaughtered in one scene and then the next scene on comes the comedian and just brings the house down. So for us, tragedy and comedy lay very, very close side by side and all in a day. Um, so that, that gave it this very distinctive texture where because we were in this place of sort of social realism, we weren't just in this kind of flat line of, um, of, of sort of gloom. Yeah, and that came through and uh, both tragedy and comedy have to be rooted in real life and that's when it's its best. And, but I also understand in scenes where there were no, or no dialogue or little dialogue, obviously, uh, the horrendous scene of the uh, abuse, horrendous in the sense that it was really effective. And, uh, and um, I understand that was uh, something that was a team effort in the sense that uh, Claire, you and um, Ian uh, kind of choreographed this, is that correct? Or, or how oh yes, it was very Yes, sorry, um, sorry for interrupting, but it was very much cho uh, choreographed by an amazing um, fight choreographer um, who I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she was amazing because we, we almost had to treat it like very much as actors and look after ourselves through the process because there's, you know, there's great fun sort of stage fighting or like fake fighting that you do as an actor that kind of feels cool. But a domestic violence story involves a lot more than that. Um, and it was the kind of thing that we both approached with a kind of mindfulness. On the way to it, he was telling me about all the books he read about different stuff about psychology of abusers and how people who become violent, like why they become like that. Like, so he had all this huge amount of research, which meant actually he was quite sure of why Gary was the way he was therefore knew where it all came from and was able to truly be the character and, and do the job like that. It, 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 was, it was very rooted in some, something very real and um, that, that he, had, he had backed up with research. And then I also, you know, obviously I'd done my, my stuff, but I think as actors, we completely looked after each other. And then in the scene, we're able to give all we could give. Um. The house itself, and I understand, Phil, that you, obviously there's a house there, and we saw it being built uh, kind of chronologically, and it really, like, place becomes a character uh, in the film. And I understand you did lots of research, and Claire, you originally uh, researched in terms of the architects who, who built these kinds of houses, and. I don't know if it's true, but I heard the, the two of you have gotten your co contractor license and, and you're going to start a construction business. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I heard a rumor. Yeah, we went on a course together <laughs> on how to build a timber factory <laughs> and how to use both very lethal power tools, but also we learned how to hand saw with great precision, which was an amazing feeling, <laughs> and also how to do heavy lifting that I never imagined of the, of the kind. You didn't know your own strength. Um, 
Yes, it was an amazing thing. And it, it, became a, it did become a character. And of course, the challenge for us shooting it was, you know, however much I kind of tried to storyboard parts of it, it didn't exist. You know, it was, we were literally had this virgin field and Conleth got on the digger and started scraping the grass off it. And then we rushed away and filmed other stuff. And then when we came back, ooh, there was a little foundation. So it was very, um, when we keep walking back onto the location and the whole cast and crew would just gasp as they saw, you know, a frame or it covered in blue insulation. It was, it was a really magical and without going to, you know, give any spoilers, there were, there, it was very emotional that the, the, the being around it. Yeah, um, it, it, it was, um, th that kind of leads into the aspect of community um, in, in a big part of the story and, and literally you're running around all over uh, the community and meeting people and the fact that there are people who uh, wanna help you but are in no position to help you and there are people who are really have very little of their on the surface to give, but they wind up contributing to this. And uh, it takes us through that journey when you're talking to the other mothers or not talking to the other mothers at, at school and all the way to the construction crew. Um, you reference some things about how Ireland used to be in terms of housing and and, and kind of, again, we're talking about, you know, the social impact of the film where it, it doesn't, uh, it's not a documentary, not meant to be a documentary, it's entertainment. But uh, th that seemed to be a, a really important part uh, of the film and, and, and to you. And um, yeah, it was just a thing of like discovering, I read a book called Rural that was written by the architect uh, Dominic Stevens who designed the house. So he wrote this book that was sort of about how Ireland and um, like farmers and all, they farm the land differently to how they used to, obviously a couple hundred years ago since we've joined the EU, since everything's much more for like mass production and exporting. He was talking about how we used to have everything much more locally sourced and live in smaller decentralized kind of communities, but that also there was this natural thing that happened where when a new family starts their life or a couple gets married, that the community comes together and builds their first home on a patch of land and starts, starts them off with, you know, I don't know, a few chickens or a cow or something. But basically it was just a given that we help each other start each other's lives. Um, and it wasn't questioned. It was just part of life cycle. And I just thought it'd be great to remember that again because I think everything just seems to be a little harder now um, just, to, just to get the basics of food, shelter and water, even in the first world, is now becoming a bit of a challenge. And I suppose, yes, something in me wanted to sort of remember that again. Yeah, that's a beautiful, not only unfortunately thought, but it was a beautiful thing that people did. And now it's mm. so difficult for any young couple to be able to establish themselves and in most cultures it is mm -hmm. a home that that is the way to establish yourself so mm -hmm. it's a beautiful element and you see that in the cast um we mentioned uh and i can't really uh let's see if i'm pronouncing his name right is it conleth conleth bill um, yeah what a, a a difference between this part and the game of thrones uh, what a fine, fine actor he is, like all, everybody in it. But could you just, Phil, just say a couple of words about him? Yeah, he, he's an absolute um, master of character. I mean, he, ca he really has the most amazing powers of transformation. Um, this is probably very, very easy for him. He just um, had this kind of amazing stillness and... I think once we use the two words Clint Eastwood about him just being, being there with this kind of wry, um, wry one-liners that, that Claire had given him. And he was a great kind of um, other pillar opposite Harriet in the sense that they were the ones who kind of supported Claire, um, created for 
the, the ensemble, some of them were very inexperienced. Um, and the, but these, these the, the Claire, Conleth and Harriet created this atmosphere on the set where, yes, we could improvise in order to get us into scenes or out of them or to help the children really um, relax. And he was just a, a great colleague for us um, and happy to, you know, to, to, yeah, to, to su truly support. Um, I, I, I've said this before, but I think it's, I, I need to say it again. This was not only one of my favorite films from when I originally saw it at Sundance. It's one of my favorite films of the 43rd Mill Valley Film Festival. I am so happy that you've been able to share this film with us and our community here. And uh, we were able to honor you, Claire, with the Mill Valley Film Festival Award. And, Filda, that you yeah. were able to join us. You're an icon in Thank the world you. of film and opera and theater. And uh, are there any last words you would like to say about the film or its uh, future journey or anything else? Uh, well, I just want to say thank you to, to Mill Valley for selecting us. You know, it means a huge amount. We're just sad we can't be in California with you. Um, it's really cold and rainy in London. And <laughs> Wish we had we were there to, to share the festival. Well, this will not be the last time I'm sure that we will will see you and hopefully in person at our beautiful theater, which this would have been held. Uh, we have a year round theater called the Christopher B. Smith Rafael Film Center, and I was going to show you a picture, but I I didn't get to it. But this this is this is what we have, and this is certainly more than enough. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.